Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. Whether you're a pastor or a volunteer in your local congregation, Ministry in Motion is designed to offer you resources, cutting edge ideas, relevant training, and inspiration for your ministry. Our topic is how to nurture or how nurture leads to witness. And we have some special guests. Our guests are Bill Knott, the editor of the Adventist Review magazine, and Jared Thurman, who also works for the Adventist Review, but he handles strategic partnerships. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to be Thank with you. Bill and Jared, it's awesome to be able to talk to you about this wonderful subject, how nurture leads to witness. You know, already my mind is going as a pastor, what is this going to be about? This sounds fun. And as we think about this today, people need nurturing. Um, in fact, um, earlier I was thinking, once we baptize someone, yeah. then what? Yeah. So nurture is essential in a local congregation or in any ministry environment. Uh, Bill, I'll jump on you first. Uh, <laughs> how, how does this happen that nurture leads to witness? Often in contexts of when we talk about this with other pastors, with other people in ministry, we've, you discover that there are some very polarized views about this issue of nurture. Mm. pastoral care, spiritual care. There are some who are passionately in favor of it and say it's the most essential thing a pastor does. And there are others, interestingly, who are very critical. They say, well, this is hand-holding. Mm. This is creating uh, fat, indulgent Christians who, who don't grow up into the Lord and who want to always have the spiritual milk. And uh, so you find these very contrasting perspectives and my belief after the years I've watched people in the life of congregations is there's a very direct connection between caring for people's real needs and their ultimate effectiveness as witnesses. Yeah, you know, Jared, you look to be a little younger than Bill and I, so I'm going to pick on you with this whole story. You know, when babies are born, we don't just say, hey, baby, you grow up by yourself. Yeah. You live your life on your own. We have to nurture babies. And so what about young people, young adults in the church? Do they need nurture as well? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, on the point of a baby, my sister just had a baby, baby boy. Oh. And it's, it's interesting on this point of really the person who is mentoring, mentoring them and nurturing is the one who knows the needs of the, the individual or the congregation. So someone on the outside could say, you know what, you're giving those folks too much milk. <laughs> right? But yeah. the truth is, the person on the inside, as a good parent, would know, you know what, I think my uh, elders or my deacons or, you know, my congregation needs this at this time, and if you were in my shoes, you'd know why. So I think that's a key point of nurture. It's, it's really knowing the needs of the congregation. And so with young people, you know, I think that often is built on knowing where they're coming from, knowing their life experience. Mm. And so that nurturing relationship leads somewhere, and the hope is if, if both parties are in a, a way of a mutual respect, it eventually leads to witness. Somebody's witnessing something. Sure. Well, let's dive in just for a moment about that whole needs thing. How do we find out the needs of those who need nurturing? There's really no shortcut or, or, or way of avoiding the fact that a person who's leading a congregation, whether as a pastor, an elder, or just a, a person who's volunteered, sure. uh, has to spend time with individuals to understand the, the challenges in their lives. Uh, until you've sat there with young families who are wrestling with finances or marital difficulties, mm -hmm. until you've talked with, with teens who are wondering if the traditions and the forms of worship they've grown up with are still relevant to their lives, until you've sat with, with elderly members yes. and heard them talk about their loneliness and their isolation, you aren't really prepared to even preach to them on, on, a, on a morning, never mind actually offer them spiritual care. There's no shortcut to spending time. Once you spend that time, however, some assessment leads you to say, how do I help this person move forward to not only receive the word, but ultimately share the word? Sure, and Jesus spent uh, over three years with, 
with those that he nurtured. Yes. Um, and it, man, it impacted the entire world. We're sitting here today uh, because of that nurture. So nurture is very important. Um, we've dealt a lot in the church and ministry with the negatives of, of nurture. And I'm so glad we're talking about the positives of nurturing. Where in scripture would you say this is uh, evident? It's, it, you find this throughout both the Gospels, the Epistles, se relevant sections of the Old Testament. But for me, they're in one condensed place mm -hmm. uh, in the book of Ephesians. I, I find two very compelling passages, and they do come in a particular order. <laughs> Ephesians 2 and verses 13 and following talk about you who were once far off. Well, actually, that was all of us at one point. We were estranged from God. Sure. We were estranged from each other. We fought with each other. We, we were in contention. We, we didn't like each other because of race or history. Mm. God has called us into a new healing community, Ephesians 2 says. And Paul takes quite a bit of time to describe what that healing community looks and feels like. Mm. But it's going somewhere. <laughs> okay. Two chapters later in Ephesians 4, he reminds us, but you were all given gifts to go out there and replicate God's healing with more people, to bring more people into the community of faith. Wow. I think there's a divine order in those. Ephesians 2 comes before Ephesians 4, just as effective nurture comes before effective witness. Yeah, and so the, the whole giftedness approach. Mm -hmm. um, Jared, you, you, you are in charge of... Well, you are an entrepreneur. I'll put it out there. Yeah, sure. And you're in charge of partnerships with the Adventist Review. So you've seen friends, you've seen business partners who are gifted. Um, if they are nurtured, how do you see this benefiting ministry? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I look at some beautiful points we learn about Jesus' life. He familiarized himself with people's lives. You know, I think a lot of times we think, you know, if, if I am exposed to a certain, you know, media or mm. uh, something in the world, I'm contaminated. The truth of the matter is, what if you were really thinking, you know what, that guy at work, he, uh, he's obsessed with this thing. Sure. So I actually want to minister to him. I need to maybe find out a little bit about that thing he likes so much, that musician or artist or athlete, so that I can strike up a conversation and, and you know, weave myself into his life. And, and I just think about, as we look at Jesus, you know, he was always looking for that in. Sure. And, and it was always, you know, he had, sure, he had things to, to minister to in someone's life. Yeah. Jared, hold that thought. We're going to come right back to look at more nurture, how nurture leads to witness in just a moment on Ministry in Motion. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. We are especially blessed with two wonderful guests, Bill Knott and Jared Thurman from the Adventist Review. And we're dealing with and been talking about how nurture leads to witness. Jared, we left off with you exploring the, the, the wonderful ministry of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking as Jesus had these friends around him that we know as the disciples, <laughs> we, we look at his method. He mingled with these guys for over three years. Sure. You know, he, he ministered to their needs. He showed sympathy for them and eventually won their confidence from the persons looking from the outside, they may have thought, is he really spending his time wisely? Yeah. Yeah. You know, is this nurture really going to lead to witness in their lives and then perhaps others? And I just see that, you know, that that is a model where wh wherever we're at in life, that nurture, it's going to it's going to bear, bear fruit. You know, why do people question nurture? Mm. I mean, we don't question outreach or evangelism. Why do we qu question the caring, the nurture? Jesus mingled with people. Why do we question that? <laughs> In recent months, I found myself thinking a lot about what I have come to call the calendar of grace. 
<laughs> God's calendar for reshaping us and reforming us is usually longer than the ones we give each other. Sure. Uh, I want you, Ivan, to make a decision right now that's <laughs> life-changing, and I want you not only to do that, but I want you to be motivated to go out there and start changing the world by next week. Microwave. Here we Micro go. <laughs> and the reality is your life might not be anywhere close to being able to do all of that in the short span I've envisioned. Sure. God's calendar for Ivan and for Bill and for Jared is usually longer and more gracious. It's been that way in my own story. Some years ago, I went through a really powerful spiritual renewal, but I didn't engineer it. In fact, had you asked me, I probably didn't even want it. Mm -hmm. But it was people God brought into my life, some of whom I had never met before, who invested in me, prayed with me, talked with me, and I have to admit, corrected me on more than one occasion. Their investment in me over months mm -hmm. and years helped reshape my life with Christ. I was already an adult, already employed, working for the church, but I was the beneficiary of their care, their their nurturance, so that I could could someday sit here and, and say, my life has changed. So you, you, you hadn't arrived. You mean workers in the church, they're not ready for translation right away? N not even close sometimes, <laughs> yeah. That, that story in my own life has reminded me, this is how God works. He brings people around us who invest in us, help us make good decisions, and then we go out and replicate that process. We go out and say, it's because Ivan invested in me. Mm. I could do this with Jared. I could pour some of what God has showed me into his life sure. and help him grow through his challenges to the point where he now has a confident, vibrant witness to Jesus. We don't, this isn't like a, a contagion that can quickly run through a, an audience. Mm -hmm. It takes yeah. time to build but it is effective. Look what those three years with the disciples achieved. The world is still being shaken by what those disciples did. You know, that is awesome. When you think of nurture, um, some people think that it's very light. It's very, um, it's not as heavy as other things. But, but I find that when you nurture people, you, you train them. Yeah. You equip them, you, yes. you, you, that's a part of caring. Would you all like to talk about that at all uh, in the process of nurturing? Yeah, you know, I, I think of the example of, you know, an eagle with, with these baby eagles. <laughs> that mother eagle knows exactly what is needed. And the day comes when she knows, you know what? I need to tap these guys out of the nest and they got to fly. So nurture is really personal. Mm. Only that person nurturing knows what's needed at the very moment. So, so people on the outside, they can't really give as much comment as sometimes we'd like to. Yes, yes. And, and the, the skill building, and I'll call it that, that happens in, with a pastor working with individual members, recognizing that they may have an issue with anger that they're struggling with. How do I, over months, preach and teach and counsel one-on-one -on -one often to help them understand that God has a different growth model for them than being stuck in their bitterness and anger. Mm. It's when people have come alongside my life and, and helped me understand those things that my life has changed. I didn't get changed as much by a proclamation from the front. I got changed when people said, Bill, here's how you do it. Let me show you Jesus' way. Let me show you what Jesus' attitudes would be like in the moment you're facing right now. And I have to tell you, those are powerful memories when people did that. They motivate me to go out and say, God's got someone in my life I can share this with. You know, I had a uh, teacher at Oakwood University, E.E. E. Cleveland. He said it was an injustice to include people without informing them. Wow. Hmm. Come on and be a part. Well, I don't know what I'm going to be yeah. a part of. Yeah. So he says that, that's an injustice. And so today we hear words like mentorship and coaching. And yeah. I, I think that's a part of the nurture journey. Mm -hmm. it, I, I look at people in my own life who who contributed the most to whom I, I am today. And they were people who, in some cases, weren't consciously mentoring me. I think of a high school religion teacher. Hmm. I had to remind him of this years later. He had forgotten all about it. Every single day after our religion class, he 
he stayed after class to pray with me for an entire school year. You have no idea what a 17-year-old, how he, I was shaped by listening to a mature Christian pray every day. Wow. It changed my life, gave me a center in my life where I knew Jesus was real to him and Jesus was becoming real to me. Mm. I can't imagine my life without that Bible teacher having done that. Mm. It changed every direction for me. Well, he, I, as I said, when I reminded <laughs> him 20 years later and thanked him, he said, I'm sorry, Bill, I had forgotten all about it. It was his unconscious mm. spiritual care that actually blessed me the most. Any words on that, Jared? You know, I just I think know. of the, the two-way street of nurture. Oh, yeah. Somebody who's nurturing, I mean, the, the patience they have to learn. You know, there's yeah. so many things. Maybe we can talk more about it, but boy, the, the two-way street of nurture is, uh, is a whole new blessing in and of itself. You know, a word is coming to my mind very cl clearly that when you are nurtured, you are empowered. Yes. And when we come back to ministry in motion, I want to talk about that. How are you empowered if you are nurtured as you share your witness? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. We are talking about how nurture leads to witness with our special guests, Bill Knott and Jared Thurman. And we are dealing with this topic in a way that I've never heard people talk about nurture before, but it's empowering. How are people empowered when they're nurtured? There's nothing more satisfying, more fulfilling than knowing that you're in the hands of God. Mm. that your life is making a difference for someone else. That's the ultimate empowerment. You know those moments, Ivan, when in the pulpit, you know that the Spirit of God is using your words more than you planned sure. to do something out there in the congregation bigger than you could have imagined. Yes. We live for those moments in ministry where we know that we are in the center of God's will. That's the, the sense of spiritual empowerment. Wouldn't we want everyone mm everyone in our congregation to know that empowerment. Wouldn't yes. we want everyone to say, I just did the most fulfilling thing. I shared my story of how Jesus healed me and people came to Jesus as a result. There is nothing more exciting for a Christian than that storyline. Jared, what about young adults? You think they will ring with this because I call it the sweet spot. I think people are not in many sweet spots in church, but we can have people working in their sweet spot, which is the area of giftedness that God has given them. How do you think uh, young people who sometimes are relegated to wait till you're older to serve, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it could, it could be guiding people to helping them understand where is that sweet spot. Mm. You, know, you talk about nurture, sometimes it's a, a cookie cutter model. This is how you nurture. Here are the five points. These are the six locations. These are the seven <laughs> days to do it. Uh, I think for some, it may be just asking, where do you feel the Lord's calling you? And maybe yeah. asking their peers, hey, I like, I'd like to nurture. I'd like to minister. How, how, do mm. I, how do I do this? And I think it's not necessarily a prescriptive thing, mm -hmm. but more so of, you know, where do you feel the Lord leading you? Right. And have any experiences in your life that have brought you joy and given you that sense of, wow, the Lord is doing something here. And then helping people hone that skill. Sure. Uh, because I think, I think with young adults often, they've got skills and talents and passions to nurture that maybe aren't even, there aren't openings yet for those. Hmm. And I know you have many business experiences you can share with us later about maybe, but you know, there may be some pitfalls to nurture, 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 nurture. Um, but but what, what have you found to be maybe a few challenges in the area of I'm nurturing you? Because sometimes people say, I want to nurture a certain person, and that person hasn't asked them right. to nurture them. <laughs> so I don't know. What are some, what are some challenges? There, there, there has to be a covenant between people <laughs> before this can happen. Right. And, and by the way, I would add, it isn't only the older offering care to the younger. I love that. And I, I have been so ministered to by people half my age. Yes. Who had the godly insight to say, Bill, 
you look like you're struggling with this right now. Mm. Let me pray for you. Yeah. And they put their hand on me and prayed for me. <laughs> and I sat there just remarking at the goodness of God because mm. age doesn't matter in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And, and they prayed for me, helped me through a difficult moment and probably went away shaking their heads wondering how did they ever get matched up with this old guy here? <laughs> but the reality was God knew in that moment that they could pour something into my life that I needed. I, I think we've all experienced those moments where the, the river flows into the pond, but there's no outlet <laughs> and, and, and it creates stagnation. Ultimately, there has to be an outlet. Jesus described a process that didn't stop with feeling good and feeling healed. He sent healed people out to do things. Sure. They wanted to and he empowered them. He said, go tell others what the Lord has done for you. Mm. He knew that the process, if it stopped at one point, didn't replicate itself, would ultimately become dangerous. Sure. What we're describing in pastoral care and nurture could be dangerous if there wasn't an outlet for witness. Sure. And wow. thus we have to always keep those two in mind. I'm not nurturing to make them feel good. I'm nurturing so that when they feel healed, they will go out and help heal others. And if I could just add to that, you know, we talked earlier about the calendar of grace. Yeah. It's often that, you know, you're ready. You're ready to go. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to say, do you feel ready? Yeah. Sure. Have I ministered yeah. to you? Have, have, do you feel nurtured? And can you take this and share it with someone else? I think that's then when a person feels like I'm ready. They got to say it and hear it mm. and, and uh, then the Lord can use them. Otherwise, we're sending them out and they may not know that they're ready or they may not be ready. Yeah, you know, this whole thing of witnessing being born out of someone taking the time yeah. to help you. Um, I, I, I think it was said that I can't give grace yeah. until I experience grace. Have you all found that to be true in your own lives? So much so. I, I actually spent some years in ministry, I think, uh, preaching about grace hmm. before I came to understand it. And I actually learned it through the ministry of gracious people in my life sure. who took an interest in me and poured their time into me and said, Bill, you look like you could use some help here. And in that moment, God gave me the grace to say, yes, I, I really could. I could use your prayers and your counsel. And they invested. Yes. But it, there's, for all of us, we can only talk about effectively those things we know be below a head level in yeah. our lives. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, that's rich and that's heavy. And I, I want to thank you all for joining us today on Ministry in Motion. Um, I think of, of the Bible's text, uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, where Jesus says, cast all your care on me because I care for you. Yeah. The Bible says he cares for you. Jesus cared so that we could be empowered to go and witness. Amen. Thank you for joining us on Ministry in Motion today. And if you would like to join us again, we ask that you would go to our website at www ministryinmotion.tv and if you have any questions email us at feedback at ministryinmotion.tv and we will be delighted to do our best to answer your questions. Once again thanks for joining us on Ministry in Motion and until next time may God continue to bless you and your ministry.